So Lophotrochozoa is going to make up one of the three large groups of bilateral invertebrates. And Lophotrochozoa is named not necessarily for um, a shared characteristics, but these are common characteristics that are seen in several groups, but not necessarily every group. These organisms are mostly grouped together based on genetic sequencing. So the name Lopho comes from this Lophophore. So that's right here. This is a filter feeding apparatus, the Lophophore. And then Troco comes from the Trochophore. So this is a Trochophore larvae, and it's got this ring of cilia around the top. So Lophotrochozoa is going to include several different groups. We've got the flatworms, which are the platyhelminthes. We have the rotifers and acanthocephalins, which are closely related to each other. The ectoprox and brachiopods are both going to have the lophophore feeding structures. Mollusks, which do have a trochophore larvae, as well as annelids, so the segmented worms. Let's start by looking at platyhelminthes. So these are the flatworms. They are asolomates, so they have no coelom, no body cavity. And they have a gastrovascular cavity with one opening, so they have that shared mouth anus. Um, most of these are free living, so we have the planarians as well as lot, many marine and freshwater um, free living flatworms. And you'll notice that these flatworms are obviously flattened, um, so they look a little bit like flattened rectangles. Um, and so this means that they have a very high surface area to volume ratio and are able to absorb oxygen through their skin. Almost all of their cells are close enough to the water that they can just absorb oxygen through their body cells. Um, so they don't need lungs or circulatory system or anything like that to transport um, oxygen around their body. Same thing with the gastrovascular cavity. So enough cells in their body come in contact with their gastro cap their stomach cavity, and so they're able to absorb nutrients directly into their cells without needing any kind of circulatory system. Um, they do, however, need an osmoregulatory system. So they have uh, protonephridia. So you can see these tubules running throughout the entire body. And these connect to ducts in the outside of the body, and these are going to pull fluid through them to help with maintaining um, water balance throughout the body of these cells. Platyhelminthes, so the flatworms, can either be free living or parasitic. Most free living, the best known, are the planarians, and these planarians are these cute little guys down here that have a little bit of an arrow like head. They have two little eye spots on the top of their head. Um, they generally have the centralized nerve net up in the head. Um, and these are actually hermaphroditic, meaning that they have both male and female uh, reproductive capacities. But they can also reproduce um, asexually. So planarians are really cool. If you cut a planarian in half, you will eventually get two planarians. So the tail end will grow a head, and then the head end will grow a tail, and then you'll have two exact clones. So these guys are able to regenerate. So they actually do this on their own. Um, so if they need to reproduce asexually, they can just pinch off into a head and a tail, and then each of those will develop into a full planarian. There are two big groups of parasitic uh, platyhelminthes. So we have the trematodes, these are also called uh, flukes. And these are parasites that are found in a lot of different vertebrates. Um, so these often have motile larvae that live in uh, water. And so this is common in water that gets contaminated by things like feces. Um, those motile larvae would make their way into a host where they would then uh, reproduce make mature flukes, um, and then excrete ciliated larvae back into the water. Most flukes need multiple different hosts. So you can see this one example of a fluke has a human host and a snail host. Um, and so to create its entire life cycle, it actually needs to go through several different uh, vertebrate or invertebrate hosts. 
Another group are the tapeworms. So you can see the tapeworm over here. It can be this really, really long structure, and these can be meters long. Uh, the tapeworms typically live in the intestines of vertebrate animals. Um, so cows, pigs, humans can have tapeworms as well. Uh, so what will happen is they have this scolex, this region with these hooks and suckers, and they will attach to the intestine. Again, these are flat, so they don't actually need to eat anything. What they do is they live in the intestine, which is full of nutrients, and they just absorb nutrients into their skin from the intestines. Uh, the proglottids at our each segment is called a proglottid, and the proglottids near the tail can become mature with sexual organs, um, and then eventually can create fertilized eggs and then break off those segments that can be excreted through the feces and then uh, go on to find a new host. So animals might pick up a tapeworm through um, contaminated water. Uh, most humans in a first world country are not going to pick up tapeworms in contaminated water, um, but are likely to maybe get a tapeworm from uncooked pork or cows. So if a cow or pork is infected with a tapeworm, they can actually develop cysts in the muscle cells. And then when you eat undercooked meat, you can get uh, parasites that then would break out of their cysts and then infect your body.